Okie doke, good morning everybody, no good afternoon even, time's flying by already. Uh, my name's Phil Seaton, I uh, spent 32 years teaching biology at Kidderminster College, uh, I then took early retirement uh, because I wanted to work in orchid conservation and I ended up by managing a project for uh, Kew Gardens uh, based at the Millennium Seed Bank, which I'm still involved with I have to say as a, as a volunteer. Uh, and I also now run an orchid micropropagation lab at King Charles I School in Kidderminster because I am desperate to get young people uh, involved in uh, conservation and understanding why biodiversity is important. I have already changed the title uh, that, I was, uh, that I was given uh, because uh, I thought using indicator species for biodiversity decline. How am I going to talk about that? And then suddenly I realised uh, that some of my colleagues uh, in, uh, in the States are pushing this <coughs> idea of orchids being the canaries in the coal mine. Uh, because, of course, orchids are particularly um, sensitive to environmental change. So here we go. Look, I'm getting older. Uh, this, is, this, is what's, uh, this is what's happening. And I'm sure it's happening to a lot of you as, as well. It's a good thing, obviously, to get older. It beats not getting older anyway. And as you get older, you start to think a little bit more about the, about the past, I'm afraid. And I've become very interested in what's uh, happened in the past. So here we are. Look, here's my granddad, born in 1876. Here's my great-granddad, born in the 1860s somewhere. I'm not sure where, when my grandma was, was born. But that cute little boy there is me, and that cute little boy there is, is me also, and that's my, my cousin John. And, you know, you're sort of wondering uh, what the world was like when they were youngsters. Yes, when my grandparents were youngsters. And the answer is, of course, the world was a very different place, wasn't it? Yeah, my grandparents were uh, servants in the countryside, and in the springtime, the country must have been absolutely wonderful, uh, because we know that we have lost something like, I don't know, it all depends who you read, but anyway, 90-something percent of, of, of wildflower meadows have disappeared since, well, actually since I was born, yes, yeah, since just after the uh, Second World War. And, of course, we also had this wonderful orchid in this country called Cypripedium calceolus, the lady slipper orchid, which actually went down to one individual plant in the wild because everybody loved it and was digging it up. Uh, so, it's, you know, it more or less disappeared. And, of course, when I was a little boy, we heard cuckoos. Yeah, cuckoos are disappearing, aren't they? This is, this is really very, very sad. I could listen to cuckoos in my bedroom and now I have to go to the wild forest and I'll get to see one now and again. So look, when my, my grandparents were youngsters, obviously what was happening with the orchids, because I'm an orchid person, so that's what I'm going to talk about, what was happening with the orchids is that they were impor being imported from the tropics in vast numbers. Yes, by the tens of thousands. Yeah? And in order to, to import them, Thousands of trees were being cut down. And the question you've got to ask yourself is, where are they all now? And the answer is mostly dead. Yes, they disappeared. And this is, this is of some concern to me. And look, the problem is, it's still going on. If you, if you were to go to Mexico City in May, you will see this beautiful orchid, Lelia speciosa, on the sale. Yes, quite illegally, of course. Um, but it's still still there and you know this was happening back in the 1940s and it's still still going on today so I get really quite upset about this and I'm thinking you know what was the world like and it's really quite difficult I think to to sort of get more than a, a, than a glimpse of what the the world was like but by chance I came across this fellow here, this is Marcelo in Brazil, and he'd taken a friend of mine to see this beautiful orchid here. This is Sophronitis, well it's now called Cattleya anyway, but Sophronitis coccinia to me anyway, growing epiphytically on this Araucaria. Not this one, this is in Chile, but this one is in, in, in Brazil. And sites like this are becoming increasingly rare. <coughs> Having said that, I've just been to Colombia, sorry, but there you go, somebody has to go. Um, I've just been to Colombia in, in November uh, to talk at a conference there, 
and I was taken to see this, this wonderful orchid here, which is called Cattleya trianae. It's the national flower of, of Colombia, and I'm, I'm hoping that you, you, you think it's as wonderful as I do. The tree was absolutely full of it, but there's no way that you can get a you can get a, 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 a good photograph to show you what it was like. So this is the world, in many ways, I'm afraid, as it was. Yeah. If you were to go to China, you can still see remnants of what they were. You can still find, much to my amazement, in Yachang province, vast colonies of this beautiful orchid here called Paphiopedalum uh, hirsutissimum. But the general fate, I have to say, of orchids in China is as soon as a new species is discovered, it's dug up and disappears. Yes, so this is, this is the exception. Uh, this is not, not the rule. So I worry about these wonderful things that I'm, you know, I've just shown you a, 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 a quick glimpse of. I also worry about the things that nobody thinks of as being very spectacular. This is an orchid called R. Hart Weggii, uh, being photographed by my friend here, uh, Francisco. Here you are. Uh, there's, the, there's the orchid. He's got the super big camera. I've got the, I don't know, the sort of normal camera, if you like. So he takes the photograph for me. And I just think to myself, I don't know. What can you say? It's, you know, it's easy to get funding to, to, to preserve something like that, or relatively easy, but it's not so easy to get funding to preserve something, uh, something like that. So here we are, why orchids? Well, for me, you know, they're beautiful, but 25,000 species, I don't know, possibly 30,000 species. You know, the bad news again is we don't really know, do we? We're losing all this biodiversity, and yet we still don't really know how many species we've got out there. So the orchids illustrate that as a, as a problem. Some of these things remain. I took this photograph the other, the other day. Uh, this, is, uh, this is Mariano of the Eric Young Orchid Foundation in, in Jersey. He is showing you an orchid here, uh, which, I, which he was telling me has more or less disappeared from Colombia. The best varieties were imported in the 19th century. Yes, as in the photograph I showed you earlier on. And of course they're horticulturally important because they're used to breed all these wonderful odontoglossums that you very rarely see these days. We're interested in conserving diversity as well, are we not, within species. This is, this is Lelia anceps. This is an orchid again from Mexico. I grow it in my greenhouse at, at home because it's so beautiful but also to demonstrate that it's important that we conserve the diversity within, within species. And of course we need to preserve the places where they live. Yes, this is the Fakihachi Strand in, um, in, the, in the Florida Everglades. And what you have to remember, or what you have to imagine folks, is that I'm taking that photograph, I'm looking for this, this wonderful ghost orchid here, uh, but I am stood up to my knees in water, Yes, also looking out for the alligators because this is February and the water is warmer in February than the land, so the alligators are in the water uh, rather than being on the, on the land. Uh, happily, we didn't see any, but one a person was bitten the week before. So we do know what's happening, don't we? We know we're changing the world, yeah, and not in a good way. I might say we know this is this is happening, and the question we might have for ourselves is what is happening to the uh, to the orchids? And I have a friend called Mike Hutchins who has been monitoring a population of Ophrys fagodes, the the spider orchid, uh, on the South Downs for 32 years. Yes, probably the best population study on any plant anywhere in the world, and he's been monitoring it for 32 years. And he will tell you that this orchid is now blooming two weeks earlier than it did 32 years ago. So we know things are changing. I was in Hungary last year at this time and I was taken to see this lovely Cypripedium calceolus, which I am told is disappearing because the climate is drying out where it lives in the mountains in the north of, of Hungary. 
So we know these things are, are under threat. And, you know, back to what I said at the beginning, these things are particularly sensitive to, to environmental change. The cloud forests in the world are drying out from the bottom upwards. We know this. We have all the evidence. <coughs> the plants that live at the top have got nowhere to go. Those at the bottom can migrate up the mountain sides, but those at the top have got nowhere to go. So, you know, the big question is, you know, you're familiar with the book, no doubt. Last chance to see. Is it going to be the last chance to see some of these things? This is my mate Dave. We're in Madagascar. We're looking for Angraecum longicalca. And we know that there were only 32 plants remaining in the wild. 32 plants in the whole wide world remaining in the wild. This is what we're doing to the planet. I'm not just an orchid person. Yeah, I'm interested in all this stuff as well. So a few animals, you know, you know the dodo disappeared in the 17th century, don't you? You know that the thylacine disappeared in 1936. This is Benjamin and his keeper forgot to let him in at night and he froze to death. Yeah, this is the St. Stephen's Island wren who ate the last St. Stephen's Island wren. The Tibbles, the cat. Yes, thank you. And this, of course, is the golden toad, which disappeared really quite recently, as far as we can, we can see. We're not having a good effect on the world. This, of course, is the famous kakapo. If you show this slide to students, they all laugh because they think it's a funny-looking parrot, but this is a ground-living parrot in, in New Zealand. New Zealand being the bird extinction capital of the world. Yes, the... You know, the ground-living birds have largely disappeared due to introduced predators. And the point I want to make here is, like many of our orchids now, I'm afraid, this animal di will disappear without human intervention now. Yeah, if mankind disappeared from New Zealand tomorrow, then a lot of the ground-nesting birds would disappear in short order. So what are we doing? That's the question, you know, what should we be doing? Well, we've got the CBD, we, you know, some of us remember the Rio summit in 1992. Uh, we know that we want to conserve species, we've shown you species, genes, genetic diversity, and ecosystems, the place where they live. And of course, the Darwin Initiative is the government's response to this. We have the GSPC, the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, also... Um, and, of course, I'm here because this one interests me in particular. Obviously, I'm interested in conserving diversity and everything else, but this is, this is what I'm trying to do, is to go around getting people enthused about conserving their, their biodiversity. So, one way in which I've done this, of course, is that, as I said at the, the, the beginning in the introduction, I've been project manager, and still remain so as a volunteer, uh, for this project called Orchid Seed Stores for Sustainable Use, a Darwin Initiative project. Uh, we got the money back in 2007 for a three-year project, and we've been running it ever since. But this is our last workshop uh, held at Jardim Botanico Lancaster in Costa Rica. You can see me in the middle there. Everybody will tell you, Phil is always sandwiched between two pretty girls. So there you go. This is this is this is normal. This is this is Danny and this is Ingrid. We'll see Danny in a minute. But we have people here from oh I don't know. Let's just have a go. Yeah, Thailand, Singapore, Estonia, Philippines, Brazil, Costa Rica, Bolivia, Ecuador, Mexico, Dominican Republic. You're getting the idea. Chile. Yeah, Panama. Yes, it's a. It's a global orchid seed banking network. So what do we do? Well, obviously, the first thing we need to do is make sure things are identified correctly. And I always have this, this terrible tale to tell people that I was given seed, well, a flask of seedlings of this um, some, some time ago. I can't grow it. It's uh, Cattleya uh, Dormania, Dawiana uh, from... Uh, from Costa Rica. I gave it to a friend to grow for me. Six and seven years later he flowered it and it was that. It wasn't that. 
Now, if you're a seed banker, that really makes you think, doesn't it? Because if you've got the last little tube of seeds that you think that, you, that belong to something which has disappeared from the wild, and you germinate those seeds and they're not the thing that you think they are, you're not going to be a happy man, are you? Or a happy woman. This is, you know, this is real bad news. So, you know, we're keen to promote this idea that accurate plant identification is, is important. Ideally, of course, you would keep a herbarium specimen, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd, you know, you'd take a sample of a herbarium specimen, but not if it's the last thing uh, in the world. This is Garanti Skinneri, the national flower of Costa Rica, and that's the original collection by Skinner at, uh, at Kew Gardens. Then we teach people how to pollinate their orchids, and that is, uh, that's really quite an interesting thing to do, because what you find is that people don't know how to do it. Orchid flowers are very different in their structure uh, to your normal sort of tulips and, and daffodils, and so people do need to be trained on, on how to do this. And here we are, the group of smiling students in Brazil, because what they're doing here is they're storing the seeds then that they've collected in those little tubes there. They're drying them, and then they're going to keep them in a fridge or a minus 20 degree freezer and this is their their tutor my friend uh, Nelson uh, who is uh, showing you the seed there into a into a little thing the thing about orchid seed by the way is because they're so tiny uh, you can keep thousands of them very very easily in a very in a very small volume okay so here we are I've got this far and he hasn't told me my time's up so what I'm doing, of course, is I'm running this project now at King Charles I School in, uh, in Kidderminster, and I'm teaching young people uh, how to grow orchids from seed and mature students. And, of course, because it involves laboratory facilities in order to be able to do this, uh, it involves some really good biology and really sort of engages the students. It's something they can actually do. And, of course, the thing you might need to remember about orchid seeds is because they're so tiny in the wild, they need to encounter a symbiotic fungus in order to, to germinate. So this group of Mexicans, this is Iris and this is Pilar, they are saying, of course, those of you whose Spanish is brilliant will be able to tell me that says, without mycorrhizal fungi, there will be no trees or the, yes, the forests won't exist. So what we're doing is that we're teaching the youngsters how to grow orchids from seed, both symbiotically, that is to say, within the fun with the fungus. And so this is uh, the bird's nest orchid, which relies <coughs> entirely on its fungus component. And these are the fungi growing, uh, the fungi within the, uh, within the cells. This is my friend uh, Khaled in, in Jordan. He, is, uh, he has got a project running in Jordan where they're uh, isolating the fungi, so we're going to teach our students how to isolate the fungi. Because what we want to do, of course, is to grow orchids for reintroduction. And we are growing Dactyriza protermisa, the southern marsh orchid, and Anacamptis morio, the green-winged orchid. Um, and the Anacamptis morio actually is declining, so that you know, is a particularly interesting interesting project and by chance just up the road uh, in, by the wire forest we also have a national rarity which is cephalanthera longifolia and we're hoping to be the first per pe people in the world to learn how to germinate it and grow it and grow it from from seed so it's you know it's a very exciting thing to do i've just had a student come over from the states to work in my lab for a for a week, she's been collaborating with the North American Orchid Conservation Centre. They want to introduce this wonderful cypripedium back into the environment in, in, the, in uh, Wisconsin in the, in the States. And here she is, this is Jenny, uh, who came across from the States for, for a week. And what she's showing you there is that we have just developed a, 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 a test to, to measure the viability of our seeds using uh, tetrazolium. Okay, have I got five seconds? Yes. yes, right, okay. So, can orchid reintroductions work? Yes, of course they can. This is an example of a friend doing this 
in, uh, in Florida in the Everglades where I, I showed you. They're reintroducing the cigar orchid. Here you are, look. Matt is teaching students here how to pollinate the orchids. That's what, we're, that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing in my lab. Then if you pollinate them, if you're very lucky, then what you're going to get are seed capsules. So Dennis is a happy man. So is Mike. Yes, because there you are. You've got an orchid seed capsule. Then what you can do, here's Danny I showed you a minute ago. Danny got a, a, a grant to go to work at Atlanta Botanical Gardens. She is growing them uh, by tissue culture. Yes, what we're doing in my lab. They're growing the seedlings and then, bingo, you can reintroduce them into the wild. Thank you for your attention.